title this faith, virtue, and knowledge. Uh, get that from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. I'll read 4 and then go into 5. Whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, and by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. So we, we come to God in faith. Someone came to us and told us about Jesus, told us about God. Fortunately, a lot of us in this church were brought up in this church and we heard about Jesus from the, some of the first words we ever heard. We were, we were here every Sunday, but that's not the case with everyone. So Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In 2 Peter 1.5, he wrote this, and he, he gets to this, that in faith, then with faith, when our faith grows after we're saved, that, that added to that is virtue, and then there's other things, there's other characteristics that go along with that. But I want us to look at, at our faith aspect and the virtue aspect today. Um, let's look at a person that we usually, in society... We shun, and in Joshua, th these are these are accounts. I don't like to call them stories because these these are historical his story accounts of, of people that actually lived, actually happened. So, in Joshua chapter two, Joshua sent out two men to spy, to check out the land that was ahead of them, and that walled city that we know of, Jericho. And they just happened to run into Rahab. No, they didn't just happen to run into Rahab. That wasn't an accident. Uh, I believe Rahab was looking and desiring to get out of the lifestyle that she was in. She, along with others that lived in that area, had heard of the fame that went out of God and what he had done for his people. And that fame had, had gone through and spread. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have satellite TV. They didn't have things. But think about that, how that fame of God had spread out and already went ahead of them. So let's read chapter 2 of Joshua. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out from Cheatham two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into Harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not, no, not with whence they were, or where they were from. And it came to pass, about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I walk, no, not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way, of, way to Jordan, under the forge, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Now, here's where they make a covenant with each other. In verse 8, and Before they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Fame had spread. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our heart did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. She acknowledges God, God the Father. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness or mercy, 
that you also show kindness or mercy unto my father's house and give me a true token, a pledge of faithfulness. And that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brother and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answer her, our life for yours. So here the pledge was made. If ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land, that ye will do it, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord. I want us to look at that carefully. Through the window, for her house was upon a town wall, and dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get ye to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourself three days. There are three days until the pursuers be returned. And afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. That red scarlet thread. Remember what God had told the people of Israel when they were in captivity in, in Egypt? Remember what happened when the Passover lamb, when the Passover happened and, and they had to put blood across the doorpost? Scarlet, red blood. So this is a picture of that. It's a picture of, of protection, God's protection and God's redemption. How did she know that? Because fame had gone out. They had heard of what God had done for his people. So in verse 19, it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the, in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. If thou utter this, our business, then we will be quit or removed from our responsibility of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, according to unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. And they went and came into the mountain and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned, and the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. For even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. These two men did much like what Joshua and Caleb had done earlier when they were under Moses being led out. Now there was many others that went out there with them, but those other men came back trembling and fearful and, and telling Moses, oh no, don't go through there, they're, they're stronger than us. We won't win this. But Caleb and Joshua, they believed in God. They knew that God went before them. God actually fought their battles. And so Caleb and Joshua were the only two of those of ages 20 and below that were able to see and live in the promised land that God had promised. So this is very similar to this. So these two men were cautious with making a pact, this covenant, with Rahab. They trusted God and his leading, but they also used sense of having Rahab make a vow that would release them of their oath if she broke her word. And that was a trust that was being built between them. These two men were then let down and escaped out of the city and went to report back to Joshua. Now in chapter 6, we see that uh, the account of how Jericho fell. And so in chapter 6, in verse 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day. Now, they had been doing this for seven days in a row. And God had instructed them exactly how to do this. That the men of war would go out. And then the seven priests were to go out, and the Ark of the Covenant was with them. And so there was a long distance between where the Ark of the Covenant was and where the people were. There, was, there had to be a certain distance. I can't remember 
now exactly how far that was, but it, it wasn't close. But the ark went before, and it was God's protection of showing them. But they weren't to do the battle. They were just instructed day after day to go around and circle this city. And they only did it a few times. But on this, on this day, on the seventh day, in verse 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. So we see this in verse 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And then in verses 20 down to 23. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was within the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, and ye swear it that ye swear unto her. As the young men, and the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had, they brought out over kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And then down in verse 25. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel, even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Rahab acknowledged God. She had faith and trust in God that he would rescue her and her family. So God was working in her life. She had heard how God over and over again saved his people from their enemies. And God had been working in her life and, and her faith was shown by her actions. She believes, she trusted, and she responded. Her faith was shown by her works. And isn't that what James chapter 2 verse 25 says? Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is, is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Rahab did this without fear of her king of that region, or the people in the city, or her neighbors. She could have been killed for doing this. But think about that. What did she really have to lose? Nothing. So she knew that God had given this land to God's people, people of Israel. She would be sinning against God if she tried to uh, intervene and, and go against as the rest of the city and the inhabitants were doing. She knew that she would be sinning against God. So Rahab, by faith, that made her virtuous. And you think, well, how in the world can a harlot be a virtuous person? But we aren't born with virtue. Our character that we have is built. We have to build that. But virtue is something we're not given at birth. It's something that comes. And it's from, from the morals that we have come from God. That's a moral standard. It, it's a... There's laws in this universe that people are fighting, 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 but there are laws in God's universe. And that's, there's a moral law. And this is what Rahab was finding. Her faith had made her a virtuous person. God will save any person, and that's what I love about the account of Rahab. Amen. He, he saves everyone. doesn't matter what level, what you've done. Paul wrote that he was the chief of sinners. 
So there's no sin that God cannot forgive. And God is willing to forgive. So he is no respecter of persons. He says that over and over again in his word. But he also says, Whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. And so that's what she was doing. She was crying out to God. Rahab showed mercy to the spies. She trusted that by doing this kind, sincere act, they would show mercy on her and her family. And this is exactly what Rahab did. Faith believing God would show mercy to her and her family, that she would be freed. Now, what a picture of God's redemption that is. Isn't that how God works? God saves those that call on Him. He redeemed us. Were we really that much different than Rahab? God's Word says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin is sin. We put different levels and degrees on it, but God doesn't. So, Lord well, next week we're going to get in a little deeper on this that uh, we'll continue to see how God changes people. And when He saves, He completely saves. We'll see how virtuous Rahab was, and we'll see how God's redemptive plan worked in her life and her descendants' lives years later, and His redemptive plan is still working. So God's grace and His forgiveness is for all. Now we wouldn't think that a person like Rahab would have morals, but she did. Her faith made her a virtuous woman. Our faith has made us virtuous also. We're not the person that we used to be. I believe that Rahab was exactly where God wanted her to be. She was a broken person, and God heard her cries. Isn't that what Psalm 34, 18 says? The Lord is nigh to them that are of broken heart, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. God knows our inward thoughts. He knows, he knows us. He knew Rahab. It wasn't an accident that, that the spies just happened to come on to, to Rahab. No, God had orchestrated that. Didn't it need how God puts people in our way, in our place, that he will show himself, he'll manifest himself to us? Isn't that what he did to us when we came to him in faith? He came to us. You know, it's been said for years, I, I came to Jesus. Well, no, Jesus came to you. You just accepted. You believed. So this was a way out. Not just escaped. Like I remember when I came forward back in 1983 here in Brother Harley. Skirvin was, was preaching. I had already given my heart to the Lord that week and I had gone down. I told Donna first. I told Mom and Dad. And then I came and I talked to Brother Harley. So came forward that that following Sunday, it was a Friday night in the last week of May, and uh, came forward and Brother Harley met me and said, is this the real thing or is this an insurance policy? And I, being nervous coming up, I really didn't think and didn't ponder it too much, but it stuck with me and it still sticks with me today. This wasn't an insurance policy for me, and it wasn't an insurance policy for Ray. She believed in God. She trusted God would spare her, would spare her family. She wasn't just thinking of herself. She was thinking of her kindred also. She was thinking of other persons. God knew her heart. Now, this is a woman of, of low society. But isn't that who God came to when Jesus was on this earth? Who did he go to mostly? The Pharisees and the Sadducees he spoke to, but their hearts were hardened. He, he went to the common folk. He went to the, the lowest. He went to the publicans, the tax collectors. He went to the sinners. And this is what, this is a picture of this. We think of Rahab as being a sinner of sinners. But she's no more a sinner than we were. If you sinned one sin, if, you, if you've broken one commandment of God's, you've broken them all. And there's no one sin more worse than another. 
So we put these levels on, but God doesn't. So no person is worthless. And this is what God is showing here too. That there's no one that is worthless. Jesus came to save us and to make us whole. Make us clean. Make us virtuous. And sometimes we, we have a hard time forgetting our past. Um, I can think back on this. that Back in the early 90's that I was struggling. And uh, dad came up to me and, and he said, Son, he, says, he said, there's one thing. He said, God has forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. And that is so important. Brother Dale said last week, and I've heard him say it in the past, that we need, we can't get to heaven on forgiving ourselves. Don't get me wrong on that, because I preached that one time, and I really believe one person heard that and didn't hear anything else. We have no power to forgive ourselves, to cleanse us, to righteousness, to go to heaven. That is only through the blood of Christ. But we do need to forget our past and move on. Move on. Move ahead. Know that God has brought you out of that miry clay. He brought you out of that pit. And that he has put you up. He's made you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And he has, he has given you a new life. You are a new creature in Christ. And that old things have passed away and all things have become new. He has forgiven us. And I love that, that we need to let our past go. Quit beating ourselves up on what we did, what we did. God knows what we did, but he's also forgiven us, and he's also forgotten it. In Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. He has thrown our sins out into a sea of forgetfulness. And they're forgotten. He doesn't bring them up. And I love this, that God doesn't play with us like a yo-yo. He doesn't beat us up and pound us and say, well, you did this, you let me down. No, God is merciful and he's gracious and he, he's long-suffering to us. And he doesn't play with us and he doesn't bring up our past. The enemy does. Sad to say, family members, friends, and other people will bring up things when you get into heated arguments and things, and we say things that we shouldn't say. But God doesn't do that. So don't let the enemy steal your joy. You've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. God has got a purpose for us. He had a purpose for Rahab. He's got a purpose for us. I think of Daniel... Daniel lived a purpose-driven life. Every one of us as Christians should have a purpose-driven life. But the enemy wants to steal that. Don't let the enemy steal our joy. We have a purpose. God has saved us and brought us out and called us for, for where we're at. God knows where we're at. And God has a purpose for each and every one of us. It's wonderful in this account, because Lord willing, we'll get into this next week and we'll kind of finish this out, of how God works in people's lives and how God can use and will use people that you wouldn't think that were even worthwhile, that even mess with. But weren't we messy Amen. before we were saved? The Lord. We're a work in progress, Amen. but we're, we're forgiven. Remember that. We're forgiven. God has a purpose for each and every one of us. In this time that we're living in, in these dark times, we've talked about this in Sunday school in the past few weeks of how the, there was 400 years that went by where God didn't speak to the people not through the prophets, not anything. For 400 years, there was darkness. And it just seems today that we're living in that dark period. And uh, God is about to break through. Remember that. God is about to break through. God has a purpose for each and every person. As Sister Connie has said over and over again in Sunday school, and God tells us in His Word, whom God calls, He qualifies. Each one of us are qualified to do the task that God wants us to be. 
So I think what people ought we to be, especially in this time that we live, we ought to be the people that God has called us to be. We can be a virtuous people that we can go out, hold our heads high, not be boastful and proud, and think that we did these things on our own because it's all Jesus. He did all this for us. We can't take credit for any of this. But he thought that we were worthy enough to send his son Jesus Christ to shed his blood on the cross to save us from our sins. And this is what he did for Rahab. And as we'll see, we're going to coming up, that how Rahab's life impacted so many lives. How, how is your life impacting the world? I thank God that he loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for me. That he shed his blood every drop. We were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He believed that we were worth the cost. And uh, he came, came willingly to die for us. We have been forgiven. We have been placed in to the family of God. And this is what Rahab was looking for. She was looking for a way out. I believe this. That she, I, I can't prove it that she was forced into this, to this lifestyle that she was. But she definitely wanted out. And God knew her heart. He knew her desires. He knew that she was sincere. God knows our hearts. He knew that she was sincere and that she was, she was believing in him to pull her out of this, of this life and her family also. Again, she wasn't just thinking of herself. She was thinking of others. And so this is, a, this is the wonderful thing. that It's an unselfish act. So when we sin, we don't sin just against ourselves. And this is the thing that's going on today that it's my body, it's my life, I can do what I want. No, it's not. They do not understand that this life has been given by God. This life, this body, belongs to God. People have a hard time with that because they don't want to submit. But when we submit, when we yield to God and allow Him to work, you can't imagine where God will put you and how that will affect other people in your life. People that you don't even know. Just like sin affects other people and affects people that you don't even know, it's the same way when we tell others of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are to go out. And we may never know on this earth how many people we have helped, how we reached. But when we get to heaven, I believe that, that we're going we're gonna to see results that are just going to be unimaginable of how that God has used us and that we through through our faith believing in him has made us a virtuous person forgiven and that he was he was thinking of us that we were worthy enough for him to send his gen, son Jesus Christ to die for us what what a picture of redemption Rahab is and what a picture that, that God has for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, that He redeemed us also. Remember that there's no worthless person. Don't get bogged down on your past. Move on. Move forward. And, and let God work. Let Him do the work. Don't try to do it on your own. Don't outthink God or outstep Him. Or, we, don't, we can't do that. We have to be in, in the Spirit to be able to go out to witness to people. We can be strong on what we know about Bible and, and everything else, but that doesn't amount to hill of beans unless you're spirit-led. You have to have the love of God in you to make it effective. Let God do the work. Let God work His purpose, His plan, His will out in your life and watch Him work. I used to have a thing about my work desk at work and I had on there and people would come by and they'd, they'd read it and I said plant the seeds and watch the seeds grow and that's what we're to do we're to plant the seeds God does the rest we just plant the seed but God 
through his through his mercy, through his grace, he spared Rahab and he spared us. I often wonder, why me? Why, Lord, why did you save me? But I'm so glad you did. Aren't you? All right, let's, let's stand, please. And close it. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your your love toward us, that you you think that we're worthy, Lord, for, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. Lord, we thank you for all your many blessings. We just pray, Lord, that if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today will be the day that they will give their heart to you. Lord, just work on them through your Holy Spirit. Convict them, Father. I just pray that... that uh, their ears will be open, their eyes will be, their spiritual eyes will be open to your word, to your truth. As the fame went out to the people that, as the people of Israel went ahead, that your fame went before them. And Lord, help us to be a, a mouthpiece for the world around us today, Lord, that we can, we can tell of others of your saving grace, of your love toward us, and how you changed our lives. Lord, just help us to be the people you call us to be. We thank you for the, all that are here today. We just ask your blessing on them. Those that are listening in, we just pray that your hand be upon them, Lord. And, and Lord, if, if, if there's one that's not saved, we just pray for, for them to give their heart to you. We thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you for your promises, for your sure and true. We look for your soon coming, Jesus. We long for that. 